So, uh, my name is Liz Hutchins. I'm Director of Campaigns at Friends of the Earth. My actual job title is Director of Campaigning Impact. And the idea is that I coordinate Friends of the Earth's campaigns, give them guidance, and um, it's my job to make sure that we don't just busy ourselves campaigning, but we actually really make a huge difference to the world. And um, that's a complete honour of a job to have, and um, it's also a, a huge uh, challenge, and um, we can only do it if we if we work together um, I'm, I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, her name is uh, Crystal Chazelle, and she's from an organisation called Project Drawdown. And um, before I say uh, a bit more about uh, Chris, uh, uh, Crystal and about the project, um, I wanted to say a few words about um, why we've chosen 1.5 degrees as the theme of Basecamp this year, and why this session and what Crystal's going to say is so important um, to us and everybody here. Um, many, of, many of you, all of us, were on demonstrations ahead of the Paris climate talks. Who, who was on a demonstration? Yeah, <laughs> and around the world, uh, this was the biggest set of demonstrations on climate change ever. This is like was the high point uh, in history of humanity coming together and demanding that world leaders take um, more action, are uh, more um, more ambitious, and uh, treat the issue with more seriousness and, and urgency. And uh, the really the message from all of us was that time is running out, and we need to act now. As we went into the Paris climate talks, we were expecting world leaders to come together, have their lengthy negotiations, and come out with uh, a, a, a deal that was based on keep, keeping global temperatures to two degrees, and that was that was the expectation going in. But something really unexpected and extraordinary happened, and that is that world leaders actually were forced into a position where they uh, said that... Um, they, and I'm going to read it out, the, the deal commits parties to hold the increase in global average temperatures to well below 2 degrees C and to pursue efforts to limit temperature increases to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. So that's sort of quite a, a mouthful. But the, the, the point is that the concession that world leaders made um, under pressure from all of us um, to... Uh, commit that temp uh, to keep global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. The reason that is so significant is that it's in that concession lies the the future and the well-being of billions of people on our planet. And I think many people have just heard from Assad Raymond about the um, kind of implications already of uh, around a one degree uh, rise in temperatures. And so um, condemning the world to two degrees was just completely untenable. And that's that's what um, uh, millions of us said as we demonstrated beforehand. Um, so our task as campaigners and what Friends of the Earth wants to do um, in, the, in the next couple of years in particular is to make sure these efforts <laughs> that global leaders have agree agreed to pursue um, are pursued like the future of humanity depends on it. And that's our task. Our task is to put pressure on politicians for that, that to happen. And the reason I'm so pleased to be introducing uh, Crystal is that... Um, Project Drawdown is, uh, is a project that is a systematic study of the very solutions that we need to get on track for 1.5 degrees. Um, and this session will look uh, at those solutions in detail and particularly be looking at the solutions that are already working um, around the world to, to cut climate emissions. Um, and um, you know some of the what, what's really striking about the project, and, and, and Crystal will uh, t talk to you about it and, and explain it all. You know, actually, a lot of the solutions that Crystal's going to talk about, we're all really familiar with. Um, you know, there are things that people in this room have been campaigning for for decades. Some of them will be surprises. In particular, there'll be surprises about how impactful some of the um, solutions are. Not all of the solutions we might all agree with, and there are some solutions in there that Friends of the Earth won't be calling for. But it's, nonetheless, it's interesting and, and very useful to hear um, this this work explained to us. So we're going to hear from Crystal about some of these what's going uh, what's already proven to be working in terms of cutting emissions globally then we're going to have some discussion uh, in the room and I'm particularly keen to hear and I know Crystal is as well we've been talking earlier about 
the solutions that you're already engaged in in your communities. So what is it that is going to um, get us on track to 1.5 degrees? And yesterday we had a discussion about um, prefigurative politics and campaigning. And um, what's really exciting, I think, about um, and, and what makes climate change not just terrifying, but actually the, there's kind of hope in there, is that a lot of the solutions that we need to reach for are already um, tested and just need to be scaled up. So. Um, to say a few words about Crystal, uh, Crystal Chazelle um, manages engagement and research fellowships at Project Drawdown. And Crystal collaborated with a global team of researchers to produce the New York Times bestseller book called Drawdown. Um, and it's called Drawdown, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And I definitely want to hear about that. I'm sure you do too. Um, Crystal is um, incredibly qualified. She's got a background in law, environmental science, and business management. Um, she's based in San Francisco Bay, California. And when she spoke to um, some staff at Friends of the Earth's headquarters a couple of days ago, she was struggling a little bit with uh, jet lag. Since then, she's been to a wedding <laughs> and arrived at base camp quite late last night. Um, but we're incredibly pleased to um, have her with us today and very excited to hear what she's got to say to us. Crystal. Good, good morning. So I want to know if my mic is working. Are you able to hear me? All right. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so first of all, I hope everyone is having a good morning so far. How's it going? <laughs> Great. And I want to say what a privilege it is to give the John Preeti Memorial Lecture. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to share something about myself that I don't usually share. I usually keep it um, close to my heart, which is that I'm a person who dreams big. And I like to set fantastically um, <laughs> I like to set fantastically optimistic and um, forward-thinking goals for myself that force me to live into a future that I imagine every day, force me to imagine my future and live into it, and that's no matter what the current reality of my circumstances is. Now, I suspect that there's more than a few of you here who are the same way. Draw down. I want you to remember this word, and I hope that by the end of our time together, it's not working? Okay. So, draw down. I want you to remember this word, and I hope that by the end of our time together, this will be a word that you embrace. In the context of climate, it means the point when concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere peak and begin to, to decline year to year. This is required in order to restore our natural carbon cycle and to move toward reversing global warming. Now, we all know the problem. We know that greenhouse gases are at record levels. I, I won't spend time talking about the problem, but I do want to spend time talking about getting to drawdown the point when the levels of greenhouse gases start to go down. This is Project Drawdown's mission and vision. Now, I know that the theme for base camp this year is getting on track for 1.5 degrees, but I would like to propose an alternative goal. So we propose that reversing global warming is the only goal that makes sense for humanity. Now, why is this the only goal that makes sense? Because simply slowing the rate of warming is not enough. Just putting a cap on greenhouse gases is not enough. So take the word mitigation, which is frequently used um, in talking about the climate crisis. Mitigation is not enough. The word mitigation means to reduce the severity or the painfulness of something. Now, if we want to inspire people to act, and if we want to inspire the full effort of everyone worldwide to achieve the extraordinary, is mitigation an inspiring goal? 
is it inspiring to say that we want to reduce the painfulness of what we're going to face? Global warming is affecting everyone on Earth, to be sure, but who's already feeling the effects the most? Um, I didn't have a chance to hear Assad's talk, but I think it was all about who is feeling the effects the most. And we know that it's people of color, it's poor people, it's marginalized communities around the world. We are, this is being seen even in wealthy nations like the United States. Now, if we set a goal for the planet that sacrifices some of us, that says that it's okay that some of us are already suffering, and we're not going to address that, we're just going to prevent the rest of us from suffering, um, is that really the goal that we want to adopt? And people in the least developed countries have the lowest carbon emissions per capita, so they will, and they will also um, have the least resources to adapt to the problem. So they will bear a disproportionate amount of suffering to a problem they've contributed to the least. So let's not hold back when we set this goal. Let's set the most fair goal, the most just goal, the only goal that makes sense for humanity, which is to reverse global warming. Now, <laughs> now, Project Drawdown is also committed to changing the conversation around global warming. So much of what we hear about the issue is overwhelmingly disheartening. So the headlines are very dire. We hear about the severe storms, the severe droughts, the flooding. And who hasn't seen the picture of that poor skinny polar bear who's floating on the tiny piece of sea ice? It's <laughs> we're also reminded that the problem will get worse, and what's more, that we are the cause. So who, would want, who wants to face this disastrous future? I mean, those of us in this room, we are engaged in the issue, but the majority of people probably are not uh, thinking about this issue all the time, and when they do hear about it, they're hearing these overwhelmingly negative um, messages. It's not inspiring. It causes people to just turn off, to be in denial, to feel guilty, which leads to apathy. Um, at the same time that we hear these overwhelmingly um, overwhelming messages about uh, global warming and the effects. The solutions that the average person hears are to change their light bulbs, maybe wash their laundry in cold water. And hearing about the magnitude of the problem, a person can start to wonder, well, can I really make a difference? Are these things that I'm being told are solutions, are they really enough? Um, is it really even going to make a difference? Another um, thing that can be disheartening for people is the military language that's used when discussing global warming. That we need to fight, combat global warming, battle, crusade. So not only are these somewhat gender-coded language, but it also implies that we are in a war with the climate and with carbon. And this is at a time when we need to recognize that we are part of the climate cycle, that carbon is a basic building block of life. It's part of who we are. It's not our enemy. But we have gotten out of balance. And it's not the time to start a war. It's the time to come into balance. So part of the mission of Project Drawdown is to switch to empowering communication that conveys a message that's solution-based, and that emphasizes collaboration and regeneration. Okay, so where do we stand? Is there a plan, or is it just game over for climate? Well, this is a core mission of Project Drawdown to determine is it possible and is it feasible to reverse global warming, and to do the math on whether it's possible, using solutions that already exist in the world, are already proven, 
are already scaling up in their adoption around the world, it inclu including no silver bullet technologies, nothing that hasn't yet been invented, nothing that's not yet proven. So Project Drawdown is an ongoing research project to map and catalog the most effective solutions to global warming currently in use around the world. And it's an effort to collect the wisdom, the creativity, and the genius of humanity and to reflect it back to the world. <laughs> Project Drawdown is an effort to collect the creativity, the genius, and the wisdom of humanity and reflect it back to the world. So this is a photo of many of the 65 researchers who we brought together. They are from 22 countries on six continents. We brought them together to research and analyze solutions and we knew this had to be a collaborative effort with a diverse team. And they used peer reviewed science and widely cited data sources to conduct this research. Um, nearly half of our researchers were women um, all had advanced degrees and about half had PhDs. We also had um, an advisory board of 100 advisors, scientists, and thought leaders in their fields who advised on methodology and research, as well as 25 outside reviewers who um, scrutinized the technical reports and models that were produced by our researchers. This is the results of our research that were published in the book drawdown. Um, the one on the right is the US edition, and on the left is the UK edition that was published earlier this year in the UK. So um, I'm not trying to sell books here. <laughs> the if information in these books is also available at drawdown.org. Even more information is available for free on the website. There are technical summaries of the research done on each solution, descriptions of the methodology used to calculate the emissions reduction potential of each solution, um, and the financial cost to put the solution into practice, as well as the savings. Presented in the book are 80 solutions that met the criteria to be included, that they were already proven, already being scaled around the world, and had um, proven potential to reduce emissions. And our research, our, our modeling, or calculating of these numbers was based on the period from 2020 to 2050, so a 30-year time period. So I'd like to review with you some of the solutions that are included so you can get an idea of the variety. Some involve actions that can be taken by any individual, but some will be, most, will be best implemented by industry or with government support. And many are the subject, could be the subject of future campaigns. <laughs> so first I'll point to some technologies that reduce the amount of emissions that go up into the atmosphere. So this is um, wind turbines offshore. Um, this is no surprise. Wind energy is at the forefront of um, solutions. Actually, onshore wind is ranked number two and um, in terms of its potential to reduce carbon dioxide. And wind is on track as the, to be the lowest so cost source of energy. This is a picture of a swimmer passing by the Sheringham Shoal offshore wind, home, wind farm off the coast of Norfolk, England. Now, I want to point out to you, I know it's um, early on a Saturday morning, but I want to point out to you what some of these numbers mean. I'm not a numbers person, so bear with me. And, but some of you may find this interesting, and it really was the core purpose of our research, so I want to point it out. Where you see the ranking, um, this is where the solution fell in comparison to other solutions in its potential to reduce 
CO2 in the atmosphere over 30 years. And that's CO2 or CO2 equivalents. So um, where it's reducing the amount of methane going into the atmosphere, it's we've converted that to CO2 equivalent so that we're comparing apples to apples. Where you see the reduced CO2 in gigatons, that um, this, this shows the um, gigatons of CO2 that the solution has a potential to re reduce over a 30-year period compared to a world where nothing changes. So in the case of offshore wind, this solution has the potential to send 14 gigatons less carbon into the atmosphere than would go up if we changed nothing. How much is a gigaton? It's hard to visualize, but First of all, it's one billion tons. And um, if you imagine 400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools, that's about one gigaton of water. Now, where you see the net cost on the slide, this is how much money would be required to implement the solution over 30 years compared to the cost of business as usual. So if you take the cost of what we'd be doing anyway for um, power, um, implementing offshore wind, um, this, this shows the cost um, over what we would be doing anyway. And the net operational savings, this is a savings to be had from implementing the solution compared to business as usual. Rooftop solar, this solution is ranked number 10. Um, it's another that we already know is important for reducing emissions. And like all of the solutions that are cataloged in Drawdown, its emission reduction potential is the second, the third, or even the fourth benefit of the solution. So almost none of the solutions um, in Drawdown are, have emissions reduction as their number one benefit. They all have cascading benefits, and so that we call them no regret solutions because they are things that we should be doing anyway because of their other benefits. This um, photo shows a Euros woman in Peru who, who is living on an island made of straw in Lake Titicaca. More than a billion people around the world, including this woman, do not have access to the power grid. So rooftop solar is an important solution for bringing power to people who don't have it and won't have access to a grid. Rooftop solar, it also provides clean electricity by replacing kerosene lamps and diesel generators, which benefits health and well-being. And it creates jobs and energizes economies, contributes to education by allowing children to study at night. Electric bikes. This is the most common and fastest selling alternative fuel vehicle. 31 million were sold in 2012 and 95% of e-bikes are sold in China. Water distribution efficiency. So this refers to controlling leaks and managing water pressure in municipal water systems. And since pumping water for processing and distribution uses electricity, an efficient system both saves energy and conserves water. An example is Manila in the Philippines, where they were able to cut losses, water losses in half and serve, and as a result, serve an additional 1.3 million people, a benefit that has nothing to do with climate, but also does benefit the climate. Now, telepresence, this solution refers to um, the avoided emissions that would result from air travel. And this is a solution that's close to my heart because we wouldn't have been able to conduct this global research project with researchers who were around the world were it not for telepresence. We conducted all of our meetings um, via teleconference um, and it was just a joy to connect with people in different parts of the world and different time zones. This, this entire research project would not have been possible without telepresence. Now I'd like to point out some of the practices that sequester carbon. And these are land use practices that draw carbon out of the atmosphere through photosynthesis. 
and store it in plants and in the soil. And these solutions illustrate the fact that working in harmony with Earth's natural processes is a way to solve many of the problems that face humanity, not just global warming. This is multi-strata agroforestry. This is a land use practice that's found primarily in the tropics. It can sequester carbon at the same rates as tropical forests and has the same benefits as tropical forests while providing food and income from crops. It involves an overstory of taller trees and an understory of crops that mimics the structure of forests. It's ideal for small holders and also home gardens. And for example, coffee and cacao can grow in the shade of other tree, tree crops. And it's also suited to steep slopes that might otherwise um, not be able to support crops. So there are multiple benefits from this solution. Preventing erosion and flooding, recharging groundwater, restoring degraded soil, and supporting biodiversity. Okay, improved rice cultivation. This solution reduces emission and sequesters carbon. Growing rice in flooded paddies is an ideal environment for the microbes that produce methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. So using techniques that alternate wetting and drying that at time points drain the paddies, plus a balanced application of nutrients and seeding without tilling um, are what comprise this solution. And the benefit is that rice production is more efficient, it's more dependable and sustainable, as well as greater yields of rice. Now I'd like to share some of the insights that we found from the research. All right, so this slide actually shows the top 20 solutions. <laughs> You can't um, see all of them, but um, uh, in, the, in the next slides, you'll see a lot more about them, okay? Okay, of the top 20, refrigerant management is ranked number one in terms of its potential for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this refers to management and destruction of refrigerants that are already in circulation um, by reducing leaks and by proper destruction at the end of life. So it's the management of the HFCs that are in existing units. So we found that as a surprise. No one expected that refrigerant management would come out as number one. We expected it to be something like solar or wind. <laughs> Now, of the top 20, five of those are electricity generation solutions. So we usually when we think about, or when many of us think about um, solutions to global warming, we think about alternative energy, non-fossil fuel energy. And absolutely, these are very important solutions, and we must move toward 100% renewable energy. But what's also surprising is that of the top 20, eight are in the, what we call the food sector. So that's what we produce, how we produce it, and how much we waste. It turns out that food, the food sector, is the most impactful sector among solutions to global warming. Now, this is important because all of us eat food, and so all of us have a role in, in this, these very effective ways of reducing global warming. Reduced food waste is ranked number three, and this refers to waste in the entire supply chain, where we need better infrastructure, especially in developing countries. And in high-income countries, this refers to consumer waste, buying too much, uh, um, not choosing fruits and vegetables because of the aesthetics. <laughs> and. 35% of food in high-income countries is thrown out by consumers. So this is something that all of us can get on board with. 
when we um, calculated the impacts of the solution, um, it was based on the numbers resulted from 50% of food waste being reduced, not even 100%. And the obvious benefits of this solution are reducing hunger and avoiding deforestation for additional farmland. So this is something, I, if you're like me, you have friends and family who global warming's not really on their radar. They don't know much about the issue, but they may not be familiar with solutions, but everyone, every one of them can reduce the amount of food that they waste. Plant-rich diet came in at number four. And this refers to having 50% of people restrict their diet to 2,500 calories per day and reduce meat consumption overall. Um, Americans, in particular, consume much more protein than is needed. Now, this, the benefits of this are health. We, we know that consuming less meat is more healthy. Um, we don't. It's not even necessary, to get the benefit from the solution, it's not even necessary that everyone be a vegetarian or a vegan. Just to have more of a plant-rich diet and reduce the amount of meat consumed can have a, an enormous impact. Silvopasture, this is one of my favorites because it's so inter interesting. It refers to integrating trees into pastures. Now, pastures with trees sequester five to 10 times more carbon than pastures without trees. When um, sil silvopasture is implemented and animals graze amongst trees, animal health goes up. They produce more meat, more milk, and more offspring. So there is no excuse for saying this will decrease productivity. The opposite is true. And not only that, for landowners, they can um, also produce additional products on the same land that's used for grazing, such as fruit and nuts from trees. Now, grazing of livestock is the world's largest land use. 2% of global grassland devoted to silvopasture could remove and store roughly 31 billion tons of carbon dioxide between 2020 and 2050. Now, that's the same impact as what we calculated for both rooftop solar and industrial LED lighting combined. So this is a very effective solution. There's been an explosion of silvopasture in Latin America, and the Costa Rican, Colombian, and Nicaraguan governments all offer payments to ranchers to convert to silvopasture. In Costa Rica, or 90% of pastures now incorporate trees. <laughs> Regenerative agriculture, and I think this is what Friends of the Earth refers to as agroecology. It restores degraded land. There's no tillage used. Diverse cover crops and crop rotation is implemented. No fertilizer is used and no pesticides. Uh, the benefits are soil health, water retention, drought tolerance, reduced erosion, increased income for farmers. Managed grazing is another that involves grazing animals. Grazing animals are wonderful. They create extraordinary environments such as the Serengeti. The Serengeti is there because there are grazing at animals. When animals are migratory and they cluster closely together, the result is abundant grasslands with rich carbon soil. So the techniques involved in managed grazing are move the animals to different locations to allow the ground to recover, and the benefits are higher productivity, reduced herbicides, pesticides and fertilizers, and increased biodiversity. So not only do these, um, for landowners not, or um, ranchers, not only there, is there a resulting um, increase in productivity, but there's reduced costs from buying herbicides and pesticides and fertilizer. Now, here's another surprise, is that of the top 20 women and girls solutions were <laughs> ranked six and seven. <laughs> now, if these two solutions combined, they would actually come 
out to be the number one solution to global warming. And we refer to, um, in, in the modeling, um, the, both of these solutions impact the growth of the human pop population. 62 million girls are denied education. If they are educated, they will have more agency to choose when they marry and have children. They'll have higher wages and upward mobility. <laughs> Maternal and child health mortality child mortality will drop and this is educating girls is the most powerful means of breaking intergenerational poverty not only that will help them to be better able to cope with natural disasters and extreme weather so obviously there are many many more beneficial uh, m many more benefits to educating girls than the global warming uh, solution but yet it is one of the most effective solutions for global warming Providing health care and meeting women's express needs for family planning is the number seven solution. So 225 million women in low-income countries say that they want access to choose whether to become pregnant, but they lack access to contraception. So this is simply about providing what women say that they want. Now, this is a pie chart that shows all of the 80 solutions that were modeled in Drawdown. Um, each, the colors represent the sectors. Um, there were solutions in um, eight sectors. So um, we didn't, I didn't talk about any in the transport sector or buildings and cities. But the point of showing this slide is to say that what we modeled in Drawdown was a global systems model. We cannot reach drawdown using only the top 20 solutions or the top 10 solutions. We need to increase the uptake of all of the solutions worldwide in order to reach drawdown. <coughs> now, the, there were 80 solutions included that are already proven, already being scaled up around the world. Um, but we also included in the book 20 coming attractions. And these are solutions that are not yet proven. There's not yet enough data to show um, their potential or their cost, or um, they are just solutions that are still on the horizon. So I wanted to just tell you about a few of those as well. So they were not actually not calculated in um, the re results that show that we can reach drawdown. So these, if they come online, will be solutions that add an additional impact to reducing global warming. So this is repopulating the mammoth step. It's a very interesting solution because I think it shows how the vision of one person can start um, a revolutionary sort of movement. And this is, a theory that's being advanced by Sergi Zimov. He's a geophysicist living in Northeast Siberia. He was one of the first scientists to identify that melting permafrost in the subpolar region is a major source of CO2 and methane being reduced, released to the atmosphere. So scientists long believed that herbivores disappeared in the subpolar region um, because of climate that the climate changed first and then the animals disappeared. But Sergi Zimov is proposing that the opposite is true, that human overhunting of large herbivores in this region during the Pleistocene epoch 10,000 years ago actually caused Siberia's grassland steppe ecosystem to disappear. And these include horses, moose, reindeer, muskox, elk and bison, and of course, the woolly mammoth, which is now extinct. So what uh, Mr. Zimov has done is in 1988, he established what he calls a Pleistocene park. It's, he wants to create what he calls a nor northern Serengeti and bring back the grazing animals to this region. So he has fenced in 20 square kilometers of land, um, and he's been systematically bringing back 
large herbivores to this area. The benefit of the herbivores is that when they graze, they eat the moss and small trees that could um, crowd out the grasses that the grasses can't compete with. And in addition, when they trample the snow, uh, trampling the snow makes the earth colder. It reduces the insulating effect of the snow and allows the, gra the ground to be colder, which will keep the permafrost. So um, he's done this through a series of crowdfunding campaigns. So he's just gone out to the general public to try to raise money to bring in these animals. In 2017, he drove a bunch of yaks 6,000 miles from Mongolia to Siberia, he, he himself and his son. Um, and just last week, as, after a crowdfunding campaign to be able to raise the funds to do it, he flew 12 baby bison to Siberia to join this Pleistocene park. So, <laughs> so I, I recommend um, looking at um, looking for him on the web. Very, it's very fascinating and inspiring. And of course, his vision is that he'll be able to reach a critical mass of animals and be able to prove scientifically that this is a a, a very impactful solution. This is a coming attraction that we call a cow walks onto a beach. So there's a Canadian dairy farmer, Joe Dorgan, on Prince Edward Island in Canada. He noticed that the cows that he kept next to the sea were fatter and they produced more milk. So this led him to think, maybe I should sell my seaweed, but his thought about selling the seaweed led to scientists uh, doing experiments to determine what is the effect of the seaweed on the cows. And apparently it agrees very much with their digestive systems. Um, they belch up less methane. And um, preliminary studies show that the methane produced by cows can be reduced by as much as 99% if they have seaweed in their diet. <laughs> and, so scientists at the University of California are now doing more um, intense and detailed research on this, and they have not yet reduced their findings, but they're saying that it's very promising. Um, this is a solution called, uh, actually a coming attraction called marine permaculture. Um, it's being led by Brian von Herzen. Um, he has set out to address the ocean deserts that have, have resulted as a result of rising water temperature. So he has set out to plant hundreds of thousands of kelp forests on floating structures that are submerged below sea level. So they're, they're not at the bottom of the sea, they're just submerged so that there's room for shipping to pass overhead. And each, each ton, dry ton of kelp sequesters a ton of CO2. So, and it, this kelp can provide food, fertilizer, fiber, and also this could be the solution that feeds the cows walking on the beach. <laughs> so just to conclude, I'll say that solving, actually solving humanity's problems is also the way to solve global warming. These solutions are also ways to make our world more just and equitable and they happen to also be the way that we will reverse global warming. So we propose a new goal, reversing global warming, and a regenerative system, as well as a collaborative approach. That was, that was so interesting. Thank you, Crystal. Another round of applause for Crystal Chazelle.